settle him down? <laughs> if you guys if you guys settle down for four seconds, they might play a pretty song for you. You don't have to, but just if you choose to. never works when I want it to. Alright, I'll just do the talking loud part. Every, I swear, I, I turned it on beforehand. The Holy Spirit just wants me to vibrate my voice loud in tune with this acoustic music, I think. Part of the way that we start our worship here at Grace, um, in the time and space where some congregations might have a confession and forgiveness portion, we pour this water into the baptismal font to remind ourselves that we are in a very Lutheran place, a place where you don't have to confess for God to love you, and a place where water washes away all the things we've even forgotten to be asking for forgiveness for, and that this forgiveness is the great equalizer so that we couldn't say this side of the church is a bit more sinny than this side of the church, right? I made that word up too. And so we pour this water and as we do, um, remember that you are welcome here, that you are all equal here, and that we have a God who comes to us to bless us and doesn't require us to check anything off a list or say any special magic words, but this God comes. And 
remembering when some people came to this baptismal font, um, they came to this space, and if you are someone who has seen a baptism happen before, you'll recognize this candle. It's the candle that is lit when someone is newly baptized. Tonight is a night where everyone's favorite part, almost always, is the part where we light the candles and we sing Silent Night. That happens next. What I want you to think about as we light these candles is the way that the candle was lit at this baptismal font. And what you might not know if you don't come to church all the time is that when we baptize babies in a church like this, we don't assume that the, that the baby knows any of the fancy creeds or any of the hymns or even when to stand up or sit down yet, right? They don't know how to pay attention in church. They're babies. And what we say happens in that moment is that adults or godparents stand up and they let the baby borrow their heart. We call it sharing the faith of others who believe. And the baby gets blessed and claimed by God by sharing the heart of those who believe on behalf of the baby, who put their heart and their intention into raising that person in a way that is going to make them want to also have a similar heart. And sometimes they do, and more often nowadays they don't. But we borrow each other's hearts. And so if you are in a pew tonight because someone else's faith said you have to come tonight, I'm going to light this candle and remind you that most of us when we entered this space of faith, borrowed someone else's heart. And maybe you won't make it back again, or maybe you will, but we light our candles anyway because we think light pierces the darkness and that God's love goes with us even if we never sit in a pew like this again. So we light our candles. So may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. No, no.
welcome you because it's my job. I welcome you because there is a loving congregation in this space that is, if you imagine having uh, 32 grandmas that all want to love you exorbitantly, that's maybe how I would describe Grace, though we have younger folk too. I welcome you because this welcome comes from God, and it came 2,000 years ago, and I can't screw it up. And so I hope no matter how you got here and whether we'll see you again, that you feel welcome in this space. Let us pray. God of love, thank you for choosing to be vulnerable and seeking us out even when we have forgotten you. Help us to be filled with joy, peace, and love as we look for you to be born in this world. When the angel 
children had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that is taking place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Today is a day when we celebrate a good story. Maybe the best story. Can you think of a story that's been told more than this? Just even the number of movies that the Hallmark Channel has been able to make off of this story. It's a good story, right? In Luke's Gospel, it's a story that is surprising in every single way the way it's told. It's a story that centers around a mother who is pregnant in a time when you don't pay attention to mothers. You, t you pay attention to the firstborn sons of firstborn sons of firstborn sons, and it's the men who know how to write the story, so the story tends to be about what they noticed and what they saw. You don't often get a story like this that centers around a mother. You don't get a story that's centered around shepherds very often either. I can't think of very many. When I was thinking about chat with you today, I was thinking about some of the good stories that I knew. There's, of course, the ones that become preachable, right? All the good stories from your past that you can tell while sitting around a dinner table, and maybe you tell a version, and that one family member knows the joke they always say at that one point in the story. If we were in Clark, South Dakota, at my grandmother's congregation, at some point during the worship service, she would remind me of the time that I was seven, wearing a frilly dress at Easter and looking pretty and so excited about the worship service until a few minutes later, I had wet my pants and it was coming down the pew towards them. <laughs> some of our best stories are embarrassing, right? Sometimes the stories we tell are the ones that make us look like what were we thinking? They stick in our ribs, right? And if other people aren't the ones telling those stories to make us feel bad, sometimes it's the stories we repeat in our heads. When we're trying to fall asleep, when we're looking in the mirror and having that all-too-human experience of looking in the mirror and going, ugh, about whatever flap or fold is bugging us on that particular day or the way that our hair won't go the direction we wanted to, or these pants didn't look that way in the store. We have all these stories that we tell ourselves, and all too often I think we dwell on the ones that end in us not getting what we need, us not being the hero. The news, how many, how many people saw anything on the news that was exciting this week and positive and hopeful or something where at the end you think, boy, that's good news. So often it's police chases and stories of injustice. That could have been the way Mary told this story, right? She becomes pregnant very unexpectedly, telling other people how she became pregnant is so unbelievable, we're not sure if we believe it today. And she had to tell her mom. And she had to tell her fiance. And she had to tell everyone else who heard this story how that was happening and say, because God's bringing all this great stuff our way. And that's not normally our reaction to a teenage pregnancy. Let alone how she could tell the story ridden a donkey that far while my mom's pregnant. The whole story could have been about how much she sacrificed, but in her heart she transforms this story into one that is about 
bringing justice to the world. One of my favorite lines in scripture, Mary treasures all these words and ponders them in her heart. Those wise men later, they're going to bring Jesus gold and incense, but Mary's treasure is in her heart. It's in her transformation of this story. It's not an angel that comes and says this person's going to bring an end to hunger and make sure that justice happens all the time. The angel says, you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be the Messiah. And Mary tells that story. I like to think of it as our, our tendency right now is to come up with New Year's resolutions soon and thought about what your list is. I like to think about it as Mary making a New Year's resolution for God. Instead of coming up with her own to-do list, Instead of coming up with a checklist about which top schools she wants to make sure Jesus gets into, Mary makes a to-do list for God. I expect you to feed all the hungry. I expect you to solve politics so it stops being people taking advantage of each other. I expect you to come and turn this world upside down. And I expect it to be a good story. And she keeps telling that story. I think she makes that story true. I think, I think Mary might have been stubborn enough to ride a donkey to the town where the Messiah is supposed to be born, just to make it true that the Messiah is going to be born. Right? Do you know mothers like that? <laughs> ride on a donkey to the ends of the earth to help their kid get ahead? I remember the, the flip side in the stories that my grandmother would tell about delightful things that had happened. The time that I finally got to preach at her church after two years of her making people feel guilty about it. The time I decided, this congregation knows I sometimes have harebrained ideas. And I don't wait to figure out how to do them always. I just start the project. And I decided one year that I, we were going to make gingerbread houses from scratch. And I didn't look up a recipe. I just looked up gingerbread. And I made an elaborate system of cardboard that was going to be what was going to help us make molds. And we poured it out a certain thickness and experimented with different flexibility in our gingerbread. It took about eight hours for me to finally conceive that no gingerbread house was going to be made. I think we ended up uh, constructing a flimsy something or another out of graham crackers. But my grandmother tells the story not as the failed time Megan had it in her idea to make a gingerbread house. She tells it as the time her mother laughed more than she had ever seen before. My great-grandmother Myrna sat beside me the entire time we experimented with the gingerbread house, laughing her head off. <laughs> laughing at my stupid idea, laughing at the way the gingerbread, when it was too thin, would run all over the floor, laughing at the way my grandmother was convinced we were going to figure it out like it was a Lego project. <laughs> my grandmother hadn't been able to hear probably for five years prior to that, and so my grandmother laughed usually was when she was uncomfortable because someone was talking to her and she didn't know what they were saying. And she would laugh. And we would laugh back because it was infectious. But she probably laughed for about eight and a half hours. My grandmother died. My great-grandmother Myrna died about a year and a half after that. And it became a story that united us. One that gave us hope, even though it had been longer than we could since she had been able to do all the things that she loved in life, we had these moments of laughter and trying together and not particularly getting it all right. This story today is mixed up like that too, right? Because there's bits of death in the story. There's bits of resurrection and Easter in the story. 
justice into the world. And no matter what their ingredients have been so far, we haven't checked that completely off the list, right? And so again, we get to ponder in our hearts and make a New Year's resolution for God when we pray that the hungry one will have food, that justice will come, that the world will be turned upside down, that politicians will get all the stuff done that needs to get done, that we will love ourselves and we look in that mirror and that we'll dance and get right, that we'll laugh. Passes up.
And as we pray tonight, we're going to pray a little bit differently, um, in part because there might be some introverts who get a little nervous when a pastor prays. And so I'm going to do a cycle of three times through that we're going to pray. And at the end of each time, you can um, shout things out. And if you shout it at the same time as someone else, no one will hear you or judge you. They won't hear you or judge you. Well, they'll hear you, but they probably won't judge you if you do it individually. But just for those who are, who are extra shy. So for our, our first round of prayers for God, we're going to pray for all of the people who are taking care of us in our lives. And if you're like many of the members of this congregation, you don't ask for help as much as you should. We're kind of the do everything and help other people kind of folks. So we're going to start by praying for those who take care of us. And so I'm going to ask God to thank all of those who are working cash registers, delivering the mail, driving buses, cleaning up drainage sewers when the rain comes too much. For those janitors of churches and pastors who are working a lot during this time, we pray for ushers, we pray for all of the people who, who work with electric, I mean, we, for musicians too, right? Yeah. Who else are the people who are taking care of us for whom we should pray? Teachers. Yeah. Teachers. Mm-hmm. Caregivers. Caregivers. Doctors and nurses and yeah. So we lift up all those that we had the courage to name out loud. In our second round of prayers, we're gonna pray for those who are a part of our family. In whatever way you want to define family, it can be those who you are glad are able to join you during this holiday season. It can be those who have departed already and are not in this space. And it can be those who inspired us to love in the world. I pray for my grandmother, my great grandmother. Who do you guys pray for? I pray for my mother and We pray for all of the family members we've taken for granted. We pray for the family members who took us for granted in hopes that they'll stop it. We pray for safe travels for all who are coming and going. Now in our third round, this is going to be the fun part. Okay, This is the part where we get to create our New Year's resolution for God. Particularly in this time where we light candles in the darkness is a good time to pray for the things that you've prayed for so much you don't even expect it to get fixed anymore. Okay? So here in San Francisco, we pray for an end to homelessness. We pray for peace in all places, particularly Israel this time of year. Those who are at war in the military or with mental illness or with family members or those people who argue a lot on TV. What else do we pray for? Just 
equality for everyone, everywhere, all the time, because you're God. <laughs> Hello. feels a bit denser in our hearts right now. It's, uh, they say that when you thaw, have you ever had like your hands be so cold or like your leg falls asleep and before it comes back it feels worse? So I hope that that's what our hearts are up to. Right? As we pull out all those things given up praying for because we've given up praying for you. We lift all these things to God that our prayers might rise like incense, that God will surpass our expectations, and that we may be God's work in the world to be sure that this all gets done. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Feel free to share some peace if you're not too peace. scared about it.
welcome to all who are interested. Uh, if you've never been here before, or if it's been a while, um, you would probably like to know that the congregation is in the habit of coming forward and either standing at the railing or kneeling, and they're dippers, not sippers, right? If you sip, though, I promise no one's going to give you a look, right? <laughs> okay, good. So dippers, not sippers. The big chalice is wine. The small chalice is grape juice. And we have um, some gluten-free crackers for anyone who is gluten-free. Stick your finger up. That's the easiest way for me to figure out that you're gluten-free. Um, yeah, and if that's way too many instructions to remember, just say, how am I supposed to do this? And I'll help you out. Sound good? All right, come on forward. For the meal is ready. Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you all the days of your life. Live for him and claim your fullness.
if one person tried to steal it. <laughs> Next. I have to get closer. This is my um, the cross of St. Patrick that I got when I went to Ireland. But the story that you um, won't notice, I don't know if anyone did notice who's from here, is I didn't have a string for it today. And would you know, the only string that I could find for it was a string from that helium balloon. <laughs> <laughs> The congregation is laughing because when I first arrived here as a pastor in February, I looked at their their room use rules, like when someone comes and they have a birthday party or something, and like every other line of the rules said, no helium balloons, underlined bold. No helium balloons. And I, I knew there was a story, but I didn't want to ask. Until one day, a group came and it's the group that's the reason that that was put in there <laughs> so many times. And a little preschool group, and they have their little graduation, and they look really cute. And they came on Sunday, and what was at the top of the ceiling? Aww. Do you know how long it takes for a helium balloon to come down? They told me all Sunday long as they complained about the helium balloon. And then we're trying to pay attention to the sermon, but all we're doing is watching the helium balloon, they said. <laughs> and so, being the squirrely pastor that I am, I decided that I would remind them that God can be present with them, even the thing that irritates them the most. And so our collage, every single one of the collages has the orange helium balloon in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the first one was the crown around Jesus. Cyrus made a helium balloon. <laughs> because God transforms even the irksome. Thank goodness, because sometimes we're irksome, right? And so the blessings of God, may they be big enough to make you not mind the helium balloons of your life. May the blessings of God Make it okay when you're the helium balloon of someone else's life. <laughs> May the blessings of God be so abundant that you can share them. So tangible, you don't forget. And so permanent that no one can ever take them away. Amen. 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 Let's sing it like we mean it.